Take me back to circa 68. Uh, okay. You and your mentor working together. Um, how did you, what was it like day to day? So it was very interesting. So I had come to, as I said, we came to NIH from New York University. There were three of us, uh, myself, uh, of course, uh, Baruch, and a colleague named Ira Green. And Ira and I had been postdocs together for three years, and he went back to his original institution. But when uh, Baruch came to NIH, he invited Ira, and he, so we were together. And we were talking all, all the time. Baruch, um, Baruch's wife, uh, Annette, uh, was always in the lab. She spent her, really her lifetime uh, with him. They were never apart. She was in the lab every day. And at 4 o'clock in the afternoon in his office, now today mine, um, she made tea, and Ira and I and Baruch and maybe one or two others would be there. But we were talking all the time. It was a really exciting moment. Now, of course, a lot of that talk was speculation about things you couldn't possibly do. But not all of it. A lot of it turned into work really of the first magnitude. A critical work to understanding, in the end, um, what we call today the function of major histocompatibility complex genes, what we used to refer to as histocompatibility restriction, uh, how, what T cell specificity meant, uh, even though we were just beginning to understand that there were T cells and B cells. Uh, dendritic cells didn't yet exist. Ralph Steinman hadn't yet uh, discovered them. But we knew there were antigen presenting cells, and we worked with, and we knew how central they were. Um, so the answer was it was exceedingly, it was really exciting. Uh, we probably talked about science too much. I'm sure my wife found uh, we were insufferable. Um, and, and, and she's quite right, you know. <laughs> there was not a lot of balance in those days. <laughs> but I'm sure that was true by, you know, lots of young people. That's probably. Most people you'll speak to who, I'm sure, think back to their youth, um, see it in very uh, glowing terms. <laughs> it sounds like the word collaborative would also apply. Well, there was a lot of, uh, you know, you didn't really know in the end when the day was over whose idea it was. In the sense, you know, you'd be talking, and everyone was talking all the time, and someone would bring up an idea, and then someone would elaborate on it, and someone would say, it's crap. And then they said, well, maybe not. And then after, toward the end of the uh, period, you'd have an idea. And then you say, well, whose idea was this? And you probably, it's like Rosh Oman. You ask each person in the group whose idea it was, and you'll get a different response. I'm, today, if you interview them, unfortunately, they're, they're not all alive anymore. Um, so you could easily, oh, that was my idea. But the reality is probably uh, there was, uh, someone had the idea first, obviously. But uh, there was a great deal of uh, uh, collegiality. And not everyone was the nicest person in the world. And there were arguments and et cetera. But it was a fundamentally, exceedingly exciting time. Were you, were, this will be a naive question, right. were you working mainly with Petri dishes or with electron microscopes? Right. Or? Yeah. So our work at the time was fundamentally of two types. We did some work in which we studied the behavior of I intact experimental animals, um, where we might transfer cells into them or you know, alter them in some way and see how they behave. And in the early days, uh, we worked with guinea pigs. Um, in fact, uh, just a good story, why did Benasarev come to NIH? Um, he was um, not the government type, you would have to say. He was just by way of uh, a bit of a diversion. He was uh, born in Caracas, Venezuela, from uh, parents who had emigrated from Morocco. His uh, father made a fortune early in his life, um, moved to Paris. Baruch was bought, brought up in a you know, wealthy home in Paris, uh, left France in uh, 1939, just ahead of the Germans. Uh, came to New York City, um, wasn't so, you know, had to finish his education, and the French and American systems don't jive very well, so 
he sort of fell between the cracks. He ended up at the School of General Studies at Columbia, met his wife, who was also a French emigre, uh, from a woman who's from the Dreyfus family, actually. Uh, they uh, hit it off right away. He could only get into medical school at the Medical College of Virginia, not to say that wasn't a great school, but he had a lot of difficulty getting into medical school, but he did get in. And, and so he would you know, not have been regarded as the typical government type. And he, was at, and he had been in France doing science. He was at New York University. He saw himself in an academic setting. But there was one great thing at NIH. So he had discovered uh, what uh, for the phenomenon for which he eventually got a Nobel Prize, and that was that the ability to develop immune responses against simple antigens was controlled by individual genes, it was unigenically controlled or monogenically controlled. Uh, and it turned out eventually that the genes that controlled it, w which we called immune response genes, eventually were proved to be major histocompatibility complex genes. And that was, in the end, a great finding. But, but he had done this work in guinea pigs. And the guinea pigs were all not inbred. They were outbred. It was very hard to do good genetics in them. <coughs> There was only one place in the world where there were in, inbred guinea pigs available in any numbers, and that was NIH. And he desperately wanted these guinea pigs. <laughs> so when the offer came, he was very receptive to it. He, under other circumstances, I suspect he would not have accepted it, but he was really anxious to have the guinea pigs. And indeed, he, at NIH, he completed the work for which he would eventually get the Nobel Prize. Harvard takes credit for it, but he didn't do any of the Nobel Prize work at Harvard. It was all done at New York University and NIH. He may have done a few final bits that got him there, but the basic ideas were NYU and then NIH ideas. So, um, so that's why we, and he, he came there. I wanted to go back. I loved it as I'd been there from 60 to 64, so when I learned he was thinking of going, I walked into his office and I bargained hard with him. I said, Baruch, if you take me, I'll go with you. <laughs> and, but he was very good to me, I have to say. So um, I loved it. He uh, said, I remember to this day, he said, in a good sense, he said, NIH is a factory for research. He didn't mean it in a negative way. but. He did mean it wasn't the sort of place where you, you know, might have other interests. It was people with, which are really not correct, but that's how he saw it. He saw it as one, one purpose, one purpose only. And which is true, of course. The United States government funds the National Institutes of Health for one purpose only, that we do things that are going to advance the health of the nation. It's right. But still more monodimensional than you might see at a great university. And he always, I think, in his mind, you know, that's what he wanted to be. So when the Harvard opportunity came, that was quite clear he was going to take that. 